If you'll take a copy of the Bible, open with me to the book of Ecclesiastes, as again we return to our series, working our way through the entire book of Ecclesiastes. If you don't have a Bible, you'll find one in one of the seats around you. And if you need a Bible, please take that as our gift so that you can take it with you to study it and bring it with you when you come back to worship with us each time. And again, if you're a guest with us, we are glad that you are here. We pray for guests to join us as we say each week, your presence is an answered prayer. And I invite you to take one of the Connect cards that you'll find in one of the seats around you. Complete that. Let that be your offering with us uh, as, it, as the offering plate goes, goes by a little bit later in service that just gives us a record of your visit and gives us a way to follow up with you and share with you some of the things God's doing here at Seven Oaks. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 is where we're going to be. Now, what we have noticed as we've worked our way through Ecclesiastes, a common theme has been this idea of making sense of a world that is broken by sin and how we live in a world where nothing seems to make sense, nothing seems to work the way it ought to. And so how do we live with that? And one of the themes that we've seen is the theme of using wisdom and applying wisdom when life doesn't work the way it ought to. And when we look at this text today, I think what we see the, the preacher who we, who we believe, or some, there's some debate would say, as we've said, is Solomon, who's teaching us that there are two different paths, the path of wisdom and the path of folly. Now, when we go to the Bible and we see the word folly or foolishness, it does not refer to one's level of intelligence. So if someone is a fool, that does not mean that they are not smart when we see that in the Bible. Someone who is very smart, who is very intelligent, is still capable of being a fool. A fool is someone who is focused on themselves, that typically has a willful disobedience. Often a fool is described in the Bible as being impulsive. They lack self-control. Why one who is wise is described as being disciplined and sober-minded. And what we'll see today is really a series of Proverbs that kind of contrast the way of wisdom and the way of folly. And so the way we'll look at this is I've kind of grouped them together thematically to kind of help us look at them in a way that helps us understand. So when we look at the text today, as we preach it, we're going to be moving around, kind of jumping from place to place to see the differences between wisdom and folly or wisdom and foolishness. So if you've got your place with me in Ecclesiastes 10, I invite you to stand with me as we read aloud our passage together. Ecclesiastes 10, starting in verse 1. Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench, and so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. Even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense, and he says to everyone that he is a fool. If the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay great offenses to rest. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, as it were, an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in a low place. I have seen slaves on horses and princes walking on the ground like slaves. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength, but wisdom helps one to succeed. If the serpent, if the serpent bites before it's charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. The words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. The beginnings of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness." A fool multiplies words, though no man knows what is to be, and who can tell him what will be after him? The toil of a fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child, and your princes feast in the morning. Happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobility, and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Through sloth the roof sinks in, and through indolence the house leaks. Bread is made for laughter, and wine gladdens life, and money answers everything. Even in your thoughts, do not curse the king, nor in your bedroom curse the rich, for a bird of the air will carry your voice, or some winged creature tell the matter. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you have shown us wisdom, you revealed wisdom, given us wisdom through your son Jesus. And we pray this morning that you show us, Lord, how this text points to our need for him. God, we ask that you would open our minds to understanding. We pray for your Holy Spirit to teach us, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
So our main idea of our sermon this morning is the path of wisdom is better than the path of folly in living our lives. The path of wisdom is better than the path of folly in living our lives. So we have a choice between two paths, the path of wisdom or the path of folly. And I think scripture teaches us that the path of wisdom is always going to be better. And there's several reasons why as we look at our text. The first thing we need to see is that wisdom is strong, but so is folly. We get a little bit of a warning here in learning these nature, these, the nature of these things. Wisdom is strong, but so is folly. Wisdom is better. Wisdom is strong. And people wouldn't be so quick to choose folly over wisdom if foolishness didn't have any strength to it. So let's see what the writer has to say to us about and how we see this this truth coming forth in verse 1. Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench. So a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. So the proverb here deals with ointment. We've uh, seen him, the author, use the ointment as a metaphor earlier in Ecclesiastes. It's something that's very valuable. It would have been something that they would have used that gave off a good smell. It was refreshing. And he says here that a few flies can ruin the entire jar of ointment. Well, if you get a few dead flies in a jar of ointment, well, of course, it's going to no longer smell good because those dead flies are going to cause it to stink. It's the same saying that we've had where one bad apple spoils the whole basket or bushel or however. How many flies does it take to ruin your meal at a restaurant? It's not going to take many. It's because it only takes a small contaminant to ruin whatever it is that's good about a substance. And if it's ointment, it only takes really just one dead fly to ruin the entire thing. So what he's teaching us is that wisdom, while it's good and while it's got strength, wisdom is vulnerable. Wisdom is delicate. And a little bit of folly can outweigh a whole work of wisdom. Wisdom, while strong, can be ruined by even the smallest point or smallest piece of foolishness. That's why Jesus warned against the leaven of the Pharisees in Mark 8, because their leaven permeates as as yeast permeates the entire lump of dough. It changes its substance. It's no longer the same. And you can live your whole life according to wisdom, but one foolish act can ruin the entire thing. It's sobering, the thought that we have here in a simple proverb. Folly outweighs just a little bit, just the smallest bit of folly outweighs wisdom. How many people that we know who have done great, have accomplished great things and lived their lives for 99% of the time with something wise, but yet they're remembered for the one foolish decision that they made? Lives, ministries, families can be ruined by one decision. And a life and a work that, is, that is, can be ruined, it can be spoiled with far less effort than it takes to preserve and to build. Look at verse 2. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. So depending on the wisdom or folly depends on which direction we're going to go. Now, this was written before any of our contemporary words for politics or positions. So he's not talking about our modern political system here. But in the Bible, the right hand often represents honor and goodness. When Joseph blessed his grandchildren in Genesis 50, he placed his right hand on Ephraim's head to show greater honor. Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father because the right hand is the place of honor. So he's saying that the wise go in the direction of honor or wisdom while folly goes in the opposite direction. But notice what it is that drives us to the right or to the left. It's not our minds. It's our hearts. And so wisdom or folly have strength because it comes from the heart. That means that there is a moral implication or a moral component to the concepts of wisdom and foolishness. A fool is not someone who just does dumb things or messes up from time to time. It's someone who in his heart disregards the way of wisdom, who disregards the way of God and does not fear the Lord. And if we desire wisdom, then that means we need a heart change. And heart change only comes when our eyes are open to the gospel, to the good news of salvation through Christ. All it took was one sin to ruin things for all of humanity. 
One sin in the garden infected all of humanity with sin. There is earthly wisdom where we can see good choices and bad choices, but true wisdom is only found in salvation through Christ. That's what we see in the Bible. Verse 3, even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense, and he says to everyone that he is a fool. Now, this can be interpreted a couple of different ways. It may be that the fool is calling everyone else a fool and thus showing himself to be a fool, or it could just be that when you see this person and you watch how they act, that it's going to reveal that they are a fool. I think it could probably mean both of those things. It says, this is a guy who walks down the road, and when you walk down the road, all you have to do is look at him and say, yeah, that guy is a fool. Whether it's how he acts or what he says or whatever it might be, it's going to be obvious. And fully or fully, folly or foolishness is powerful even in small doses. And if we are not careful, it will go undetected in our lives. You've probably heard the phrase or maybe thought of it, it's on all the Glade commercials and things like that, of the concept of going nose blind. Nose blind means that there's a smell that is around you, but the longer you smell it, the, the, the more used to the smell you get. And before long, you no longer even notice it. And we can become nose blind or blind to the patterns of sin and foolishness in our lives if we ignore them. So what do we do when we notice sin in our lives? Do we repent of them or do we keep going in the same direction? It's why we need each other in our lives and we need the ministry of a local church where we know people and people know us. Because we need those people that, because when we go nose blind to our sin, we have people who can point those things out to us and redirect us. That's why discipleship by more mature believers to younger believers is so important. Because we have blind spots and we become nose blind to things we no longer notice that are maybe obvious to other people. The pool of folly is strong and we need each other to help us follow the path of wisdom. Next, we see that wisdom makes work more fruitful. Skip with me down to verse 8. Wisdom makes work more fruitful. Verse 8, he who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. So during the time of the writing of this, most work was done by hand. It was manual labor, and therefore would have been pretty dangerous. There were a lot of different ways one could get hurt. In ancient Israel, you could bust through a wall and find a snake den and get bitten. Large stones as they're being moved in a quarry could fall and crush someone. When we study the history of the Industrial Revolution, we notice all kinds of accidents happened in factories where people worked because there were no regulations. And even in manual labor, even today in our modern age, people who work these types of jobs, there are dangers that they face. Wisdom prepares us and helps prevent disasters from happening. Wisdom prepares properly to try to avoid accidents, although sometimes the best preparation, there's still going to be bad things that happen. But the wise can minimize the risk of these things by preparing as much as they can. That's what he's saying. Verse 10, if the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength, but wisdom helps one to succeed. If the serpent bites before it's charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. So how many of you have ever tried to chop wood with a dull axe or cut down a tree with a dull saw? Even using a dull knife if you're cutting something up in the kitchen, you'll notice it doesn't cut. It more just kind of tears. And it might get the job done, but it's going to take a really long time, and you're going to have to you're going to wear yourself out doing a very simple task. And the preacher is saying that the wise literally works smarter rather than harder. Because if your tool is sharp, then the tool will do most of the work for you. That's why they're tools. That's why they exist. And he says a fool uses a tool that isn't prepared. And the result is that the work is a lot harder than it has to be. A wise person makes sure that his tools are ready to be used and are in good condition before he works. But what about verse 11? Talking about charming snakes, okay? That's a strange thing to us. We don't see a lot of snake charmers in the U.S., okay? At least I don't. Maybe some of you have. I don't really see him. But look what he says. He says that the snake charmer is bitten before he has the snake under control. So that must mean that it's better to charm the snake early before the snake has a chance to bite you. 
So what it seems like we're being told here that the preacher is telling us is that we need wisdom between two ends of our work. We need to know when we need to move slowly and deliberately so that we prepare, but we also need to know when it's better to act quickly before a situation gets out of control. And wisdom helps us navigate between those two extremes. One of the principles I think that we see here for us is for our ongoing growth and preparation with wisdom. It applies to anything we might encounter or do in life. If we want to start something new, then we need to educate ourselves and prepare for it. We need our own senses, our own wisdom and discernment sharpened by preparing and going into the Bible regularly, praying regularly for God to give us wisdom. Because many times when it comes time to use wisdom, if we have to stop and think about it, it may be too late. Now skip with me down to verse 15. The toil of a fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. So it seems like the fool hasn't learned the things from verses 8 through 10. He just goes off without preparation. He doesn't make, doesn't accomplish, and all he does is wear himself out. He simply wanders around uh, and, and, and wanders around aimlessly. And then in verse 18, we see that the fool is, is lazy. Look with me at verse 18. Through sloth, the roof sinks in, and through indolence, the house leaks. So any type of building is going to need ongoing maintenance. If you own a home, there are things that you should be doing in your home weekly, monthly, yearly. And a roof's kind of a big deal. It's kind of important. If you get holes in your roof, then things are going to, if you neglect it, it gets holes, it's going to eventually fall in. And someone who is lazy neglects these things, and eventually it's going to lead to disaster in a lot of different forms. So sloth or laziness is the mark of a foolish person, while someone who is wise is proactive and taking care of the things that they need to take care of. It's also a danger. Laziness and sloth is a danger to us in our spiritual health. If we're not cultivating our relationship with Christ through prayer, if we're not going to the Word of God, as we have said, then we will lose ground, and sin becomes more difficult to avoid. Temptation becomes more difficult to withstand. So we must intentionally work toward our spiritual growth. God grows us, but we have responsibility in our own sanctification of being among God's people. As I said, practicing the spiritual disciplines. Our marriages and our relationships need intentional work. We're not going to just drift into deeper relationships with each other. It happens by investing in each other. But we get a contrast to the lazy fool in verse 19. It says, bread is made for laughter and wine gladdens life and money answers everything. Okay. Now, the preacher is not saying to us that money is the cure for all things. Okay. I think many of us could probably testify to that. We can look and we can see throughout history that money does not cure everything. We've already seen in Ecclesiastes where he's warned against the idolatry of wealth and the Bible warns us that if we're not careful, we'll end up worshiping it rather than God. Jesus warns of that in Matthew 6. I think what he is saying is that the one who works generally will have what he needs. Bread is good, wine is good, and money buys those things in addition to the other things that we might need. And a wise person understands the need to work so that we can eat and get the things that we need. Money's a necessary thing. It's also helpful for the work of ministry. It helps us do things as the church. It supports missionaries that goes with the gospel. And our trust is in God, not in money. But money is necessary. And one of the things that if we are wise or following the path of wisdom is we will see that laziness is going to lead to not having what we need. So yes, when we are wise, we see that our work is more fruitful. It's easier to accomplish, and the fruit of it is greater. Next, we see that wise words are a blessing to us and to others. Wise words are a blessing to us and to others. So if we are wise, our words will be blessings to others and to ourselves. Let's move back with me back to verse 12. Look with me back at verse 12. The words of a wise man's mouth win him favor. The words of a wise man's mouth win him favor. So the word here for favor that the word that he's using there actually means grace. 
That might mean a couple of, of things, or it might be a couple of different ways to interpret this. It might mean that the wise person speaks and people listen, and so they give him things. He gets grace because of the wisdom that he's giving. Or it may mean that he speaks with wisdom and that those who listen to the wise person actually receive grace and favor because they are listening to a wise person speak. Again, it's one of those I think both could be true. If we speak with wisdom, we are going to gain respect. If we listen to wise counsel, then we are going to be blessed with what a wise person has to say. The prophet Isaiah had this to say about it because he realized that when he spoke with the words of God, he spoke with grace and it was a blessing to people. Isaiah 50, the Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Now, God, if we are followers of Christ, has given us the words of life to bring to a weary world. As people who have been changed by the grace of God and who have experienced his mercy through Christ, we now have the good news of the gospel to share with the world. People are in need of peace and reconciliation with God. They are weary. They are weary of sin, whether they realize it or not. And the only hope they have of peace and the only hope they have of rest is by putting their faith in Christ and turning from sin. And they will only know this if we tell them and if we teach them with the word of God. The words that God has given us have the power to sustain the weary because we bring the hope of reconciliation through the gospel of Jesus. Now, that's very different for the person who is foolish. Look back at the end of verse 12. It says, but the lips of a fool consume him. So the words of a fool literally come back and eat him. He is literally swallowed up by his words. It's kind of a weird picture, isn't it? Foolish words are not just empty, but they are destructive, both to the one who speaks them and to the ones around them. Verse 13 says, The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness. So one of the characteristics of a fool when he speaks is going to be it's going to start bad, and it's just going to get worse. How many of us have ever had a conversation with someone who just, just liked to talk? And it started at one point, and it just went downhill from there. And by the time they get finished, you're like, either I have no idea what you're talking about, or first you started and you were annoying, and now you're just crazy. That's a sign of foolishness. Verse 14, a fool multiplies words, though no man knows what is to be, and who can tell him what will be after him? Now, it seems as though here that it's a preacher that's talking about someone who likes to brag. A fool likes to brag and be able to talk about things that he's going to do or things that he thinks are going to happen. He likes to brag about the future. He speaks of the future with certainty, which is more like arrogance rather than dependence on himself, dependence on his ability, rather than humbly acknowledging that God is the one who is in control. That's why James tells us not to presume or assume anything's going to happen in the future. We can look and we can kind of predict things based on patterns that we understand and what we understand about God. doesn't mean we don't use our brains to prepare ourselves. But we also don't put our abilities and our intellect above the sovereign control of God and His purposes. That's why James says we should say, when we say we're going to do thus and so, it's, it's as if, if the Lord wills. Because ultimately, it's only up to the Lord whether anything's going to happen. So when it comes to how we speak, we need to remember that our witness for the gospel can be ruined with a single conversation or even a single word if we are foolish and not wise in how we speak. And we have many outlets now where we are able to give voice to things where generations before us didn't have those same outlets. As technology and instant access has now has become more broad. We can fire off a tweet or a post as soon as something enters our mind. We've got to be wise in how we use social media and how we share what we say. Are the words that you share online full of grace? Or would people consider what you posted on Facebook two years ago to be madness? When you speak at school or when you speak at work, do people listen to you or do they tune you out because you talk too much? Or you speak too harshly. 
We've got to be wise in how we speak to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ and to people who are not followers of Christ with gentleness and with wisdom. Next, we see that wisdom helps us interact with those in authority. Wisdom helps us interact with those in authority. Let's go all the way back to the beginning of the chapter, back to verse 4. Verse 4. If the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay great offenses to rest. So the advice that the preacher's given here is kind of in line with what we've already learned about knowing when and how to speak. But he's speaking specifically here about being in the presence of one in authority. He says a ruler, it could be someone who is a king, or it might be someone who is underneath a king. But there's going to be times where there's situations where you might find yourself confronted by someone in authority. Maybe it's a teacher. Maybe it's a boss. Maybe it's someone else. Police officer. Could be many others. Any other, any other examples that we might have? And they might confront you in anger or in a way that's in an emotional way because of something you have done or maybe that they think you've done, and they're coming to confront you about it. And if you have ever been in those situations, you know the difficulty when your heart begins to pound and your fight or flight kind of instinct begins to kick in. And sometimes your first intuition is to kind of just push back and to do so in anger and match their level of anger or match their level, their level of emotion. And he's saying here, don't do that. Remain calm. A foolish person reacts with an equal amount of anger or tone, trying to justify themselves. And he says, don't do that. Remain calm. The wise person remains in place and remains calm. Proverbs says, a soft answer turns away wrath. If we answer another with soft answers, that if you've ever experienced, you've probably experienced that if someone yells at you and you respond calmly, that usually lowers the temperature of the conversation. And with one in authority, Proverbs gives us this next piece of advice that says you might even win them to your side. It says in Proverbs 25, with patience, a ruler may be persuaded and a soft tongue will break a bone. Now, this does not mean that leaders are to get by with verbal abuse or abuse of their authority. But if you yell back in anger or respond to them in kind, then your, your ability to persuade is going to be lessened, obviously. And when we speak calmly to anyone, whether it's someone in authority or not, then it's going to generally have a calming effect. But how else does wisdom help us when it comes to dealing with those in authority? We get another principle in verse 20. Go all the way to the end. Go into the bookends here. Verse 20, chapter 10. Even in your thoughts, do not curse the king, nor in your bedroom curse the rich, for a bird of the air will carry your voice, or some winged creature tell the matter. Now, this sounds pretty simple, okay? But if you don't want something that you say to get back to the king, or if you don't want something you say to get back to someone in authority, don't say it. Don't say it aloud. Don't say it to anybody. Don't say it to anywhere where you might get overheard. You probably heard the phrase, a little birdie told me, okay? When someone comes to you and says, I heard something that you said, and they use that phrase. You never know when something you say that is critical or disrespectful about someone, especially in ones of authority over us, are going to get back to them and come back and get us in trouble. So wisdom says for us not to speak disrespectfully about those who are in authority, whether it's government or whoever, but even our, our bosses or teachers, as we've, as we've mentioned before. Think how easy it is for an email that we send or a text that we send to end up in a place where we don't want it to be. Or even worse, how many of us have ever sent an email or a text about someone and sent it to that person? So the principle is, if we're wise, we don't talk bad. We don't gossip about someone out loud, out loud, right? It's easy enough. I'll just keep my mouth shut and everything is okay. But look back at the beginning of verse 20 and see what he actually says. Even in your thoughts. Now, it's different. That's a different story altogether. It's hard enough to guard our mouths and to bridle our tongues, but it's even more difficult when it comes to not even cursing someone in our minds. It's the wiser path to not even think those things in regards to our leaders or other people, because if we don't think them, then we're going to be less likely to say them. One of the things that we're going to learn about tonight in our time together is that the things that we speak are the overflow of our hearts. 
So even when it comes to our leaders, particularly in government, if one's policy or our position we disagree with, or we disagree with a decision, we don't curse them. Even in our minds, we pray for them. Paul says in 1 Timothy, first of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. One of the keys to living a godly life then is to pray for other people and not curse them. If we are regularly praying for people, then we will notice our tendency to curse them is going to lessen and to weaken And instead of thinking about how much we dislike the person in authority, we need to think about how we can pray for them. We even need to go so far as to think about how we might give thanks for that person, as difficult as that might be at certain moments. And then maybe there'll be a way that we can think about how we might serve that person and show them honor, even if it's someone we dislike or disagree with. So we might get to the point where we think about how can I make my boss or my teacher's life easier and show them honor, even when I disagree or dislike them. And next we see that wisdom leads with purpose. Wisdom leads with purpose. Let's go back to verse 5. Verse 5. Wisdom leads with purpose. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, as it were, an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in low places. I have seen slaves on horses and princes walking on the ground like slaves. So the preacher says there's an error here from a ruler, meaning there's something wrong that is coming forth, and it is a decision that a ruler or someone in authority has made or someone who is in charge. A foolish ruler or a foolish king has, put the, has made the decision to put those who are wise on the ground. And he equates them to the rich here. And that the ones who occupy the seats of, of power and who occupy the seats of influence are foolish. Now, his statements here don't mean that slaves can't be trusted. He doesn't mean that the wealthy are deserving of more influence. He's just saying that the foolish don't follow common wisdom or the common wisdom of the day. That's the distinction that he's doing. So instead, he's saying that those who are often the most qualified to lead are not the ones who are put in positions of leadership. This may happen in our modern world where someone gets an office and then appoints all of their friends to offices around them. We, early in the 20th century, our country had to pass laws to keep this from happening. One example we see in the Bibles in 1 Kings where Rehoboam, he ascends to the throne of Israel. And instead of listening to wisdom, he takes his friends, puts them in positions of influence, and they give him terrible advice. And it has has ramifications and consequences for the rest of the time of the nation of Israel, long after he has left the throne. He embodied what's being described here by putting the foolish on horses and having the rich or those who can lead seated on the ground, flipping where they ought to be. We need wisdom to do what's best for those we lead. And we all lead someone. We all have authority over something. Whether it's a group of people or it's our money, it's something we have authority over. And we are we held accountable for how we do that. And when we lead, we lead for what's best for those we lead, not necessarily for us personally. Now look at verse 16. Woe to you, O land, when your child, king is a child and your princes feast in the morning. Happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobility and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Now, this may bring to our mind the picture of a young boy who sits on a throne. We've actually seen this happen in history. It happened in the, in the nation of Israel, but it also, also happened... Um, Charles, um, lost, lost my notes there. Uh, there was a, a Charles, I think it was the fifth or sixth, don't quote me on that, um, in Norway, who ascended to the throne at the age of 15. Well, what did he do but just put a lot of his friends in power with him and they rode through the streets and they busted out windows with swords and guns and they went into the palace and they just slaughtered sheep right there in the throne room to where blood just ran all the way through the palace. And it led to where three pastors on a given Sunday all preached from this very text because of what was going on before their lives. So yes, of course, an immature physically might lead to immaturity presently. But actually what I think the pastor is speaking to here, what the preacher is saying here is not necessarily the physical age, it's the mentality and the maturity of the one who holds the office. The temperament of the one who is sitting on the throne, one who rules with wisdom and maturity, is going to be better for the people than one who leads with folly. 
Because the one who leads with folly is going to indulge in things for himself rather than thinking of what is better for the kingdom. His purpose is going to be to please himself and not help his people flourish. Now, the preacher here is not condemning feasting and enjoyment in life, but there is a proper time and an occasion for those things, and wisdom knows the difference. A wise ruler knows that there is a purpose to his position and his rule. When God places people in authority, they are given stewardship. They are not given a platform for their own enjoyment. When people are placed in positions of leadership, They are called to help those they lead, as I said, flourish, not figure out how they can get fat off of them. An example we see from this of Scripture is in Joseph in the book of Genesis. Joseph's given rule over Potiphar's house, and when he's pursued by Potiphar's wife, he refuses, and he says, I cannot sin against my master, and I cannot sin against God. Later, he makes provisions and stores food so that, he can, that his people can survive a famine, doing so without being distracted by, I'm sure, all of the luxuries that were around him. He had a purpose in serving God, and he understood his purpose. Purpose was also serving the people of Egypt. I don't think that means he never ate good food and that he never attended a feast, but we see that in Scripture, he attended his job faithfully and did so with wisdom and with purpose. As I've said, we all have authority over something and we must lead with purpose and wisdom helps us to do that. Parents are called to lead their children to be disciples of Christ. We all have relationships that we can steward. How are we helping our friends and brothers and sisters in Christ to grow in the Lord and to flourish? We serve a king who led and is leading us with purpose in Jesus Christ. He's the example that we follow. He is a king who became a servant who died for us so that we might be reconciled to God. And he is alive now, leading a kingdom for the purpose of his name and his glory, leading us to one day reigning with him. So wise leadership leads with purpose. So how should we then lead? One piece that I would remind us of is that we must turn to Christ for wisdom because Christ is our wisdom from God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. It's tempting to think that all we have to do is to seek out wisdom from all of the sources that we have available to us. We can go to different philosophers that we see throughout history. We can go to the different gurus. If you go to bookstores, if you go to look on Amazon, there are all kinds of books that spout different types of philosophies and wisdoms, wisdom, types of wisdom, a way for us to live our lives that might help things be better for us. And there aren't things that we can't, I'm not going to say we can't glean certain things from them. And then we could just say that maybe life would be better and choose wisdom instead of stop doing these dumb things. The problem is we can't just stop doing dumb things on our own. Our heart wants to do those dumb things. And although we have earthly wisdom, we will not truly be wise and we won't stop doing foolish things until our minds are renewed and our hearts are transformed through the grace and the mercy of God. And he has revealed the way to do that by giving us wisdom in Christ. What we need is righteousness from God and a redemption that we cannot pay for on our own. It had to be paid for by Jesus. Christ is the one whose words show his grace. Christ is the one who responded perfectly to others when he was questioned and when he was accused. But Christ is not just a moral example for us to follow. Christ was the sacrificial lamb, killed for our forgiveness and raised again from the dead. And it is through Jesus that we are saved from the foolishness of our sin and the death that the foolishness of our sin earns. And we are given life through him. And one of the ways that we remember this,